All right, so this question says that a pulsar is a rapidly rotating neutron star, okay? Let's pretend that I don't know what a neutron star is. Don't think you need to know, so let's just keep reading. A crab nebular pulsar in the constellation Taurus, they are, okay, um, has a period, okay? Uh, let, let me just start sketching it to make sure that I have the information. So, neutron star, rotating, okay. I have enough a sense about rotating things and stars to think, okay, this is some spherical thing that's going to be rotating with some angular velocity, okay? And uh, we are being given the period. Uh, let's just say we, are, we know um, the period, which can be related to frequency by uh, period is 1 over frequency, and frequency can be related to angular velocity by frequencies omega divided by 2 pi. So we'll probably use that at some point. Uh, and we are being given the radius of this uh, star um, of 10 kilometers. And suppose, oh, wow, that is a really short period. Really? Milliseconds? Wow. Um, and suppose its mass is something large, astronomical. <laughs> um, the, so we are being given the mass as well. The pulsar's rotational period will increase over time Oh, due to the release of electromagnetic radiation. Oh, that's interesting. So um, th that means um, what it's describing is that uh, the the its uh, angular momentum uh, it's not conserved because if it's conserved and the radius of the star isn't changing, then you know angular velocity won't change. But and so which doesn't change its radius but reduces its rotational energy. Okay, so it's asking about the angular momentum of the pulsar. Um, yeah, let's uh, work it out. <laughs> so you start out with a formula for rotational uh, angular momentum. And the way I remember any formula in rotational um, um, area is by analogy. So I know my momentum is mass times velocity. So when I'm trying to remember the formula for the rotational um, rotational momentum or angular momentum, then it's going to be the rotational version of mass, which will be rotational inertia. Oh, I might need to look something up. <laughs> times the angular velocity, um, which is the rotational version of velocity. And angular velocity is actually a vector quantity um, yeah, we covered that uh, last week, so we're using cross product. So we need a rot angular, uh, we need a rotational inertia of this uh, star, which I don't think we are given. And uh, this question has some hint, some of which might be useful. Um, yeah, we expect to get no big numbers. That's not much of a hint. <laughs> um, yeah. Treat the pulsar as a sphere of uh, a sphere of uniform density when choosing which rotation inertia to use. Okay, that's interesting. So um, if nothing else, it um, tells us uh, what um, uh, what kind of formula that the answer is programmed with. So whether that's a physically, um, physically reasonable assumption or not, we're going to use it because that's uh, the assumption that the question writer wants us to make. So we need a rotational inertia of a uniform sphere. And I think I have it memorized. It's a two fifth uh, mass of the sphere times its radius squared, I think. Now, it's uh, getting to that area where um, I'm not 100% sure. So let's uh, look it up in the textbook and make sure that it's correct. Because if we use incorrect formula, we'll get incorrect answer. And we'll have done a bunch of work that we could have avoided if we had the correct formula to start with. So I'm going to just look it up in the textbook. We have chapter on fixed axis rotation. And I believe it's in this section where there's a table of rotational inertias. Um, a lot of common geometries will be here. So this is the first place to look. So in this, okay, a lot of common geometries. I'm looking for sphere. Okay, solid sphere, about any diameter. Ah, yeah, two-fifth mr squared. Okay, that is the correct formula. And yeah, this is the spherical shell, which has a different mass distribution, so different formula. Don't want to use that. Okay, so we do have the correct formula. I think uh, all the numbers here are something I can just uh, plug in. Um, so I need to 
omega turned into numbers that I can just plug in. So since I'm using um, since I'm using the um, the sage method as my calculator, I think it makes sense for me to just plug everything in all at once. So let me just uh, work out the formula for um, converting from the the period that we are given into the um, angular frequency that we'll actually need. So um, the so um, let's see. So angular frequency. Um, so kind of solving this uh, uh, relationship here in terms of frequency, that's a 2 pi times frequency. And this frequency, solving this relationship here, in terms of period, it's 1 over period. So it's a 2 pi divided by period. That'll give me the angular frequency here. So with that, uh, let me just uh, replace that here. It's going to be... 2 pi divided by period that we've been given. So this is all in terms of numbers we are given. So we can just plug in the numbers. And actually, so you can use the Sage method this way. So, um, you know, I, um, I I want to plug in numbers in a logical way where I don't have to think about uh, where what goes what. So I can still declare my, my variables. And R, T, these are the quantities that have been given to me. And even though I'm not using Sage Math to solve any equation, I can type in an expression. No one stops me from doing that. Times 2 times uh, pi divided by t. And what I can do is now I can use the substitute syntax, making sure it applies to entire expression, and just plug in the numbers that have been given to me. Mass is equal to 2.5 times 10 to the power of 30 kilogram. Make sure it's a basic SI unit. R, okay, I'm given it in kilometers. I need to convert it to meters, basic SI units. 10 times 10 to the power of 3 meters. And, um, and the period is 33.5 times 10 to the power of minus 3 seconds, basic SI units. Now, when I plug in numbers here, it'll give me something that I can't really do much with. So, but let me show you what it gives me, and then I will um, change it so that I can do more with it. Yeah, so it gives me this, um, you know, the most precise expression that is pi as it is. But, it, but that's not what I want. I want numerical approximation of this so that I can, um, I can you know, put the numbers in, in that small approximation without the pi. So, okay, in the normalized form, that's the form in which the calculator is giving me the answer. It's got this, um, I keep forgetting the name for this uh, coefficient. What is it called? I, I forget the term. There's a term for it um, in a scientific notation where this coefficient is a number between 1 and, uh, well, what number equal to 1 or greater and smaller than 10. So that there's at least one number before the decimal and then after everything decimal and the power of 10 goes that way. So it would be... 1.876 times 10 to the power of 40 joule second. That's probably correct. Um, and uh, even though, you know, if you had a number like this, that would be mathematically equivalent, it won't grade that as correct. So, you know, just put it in the normalized form, the way the question asks you to. Let's verify that is actually correct. Good. <laughs> and then the second part asks, Suppose the angular velocity decreases at this rate. Okay, that's interesting. So this is going to be the um, rate of change of angular velocity or what someone might call angular acceleration. Okay. Uh, what is the magnitude of the torque on the pulsar? Um, Keep your answer in the scientific notation. So I guess you have two different ways you can approach this question. You might think, hmm, torque, that's the rotational version of force. So you know force is mass times acceleration. So for torque, I want to say it's a rotational version of mass times rotational version of acceleration, angular acceleration, and calculate it this way. 
which you totally can. There's nothing wrong with that. You already have expression for rotation inertia. I think that might actually be the intended way to do it. But let me show you a different way you might approach it that I think is conceptually on a sounder footing. And it also gives you the same correct answers. So we talked about how this expression for force isn't always correct. Um, it's uh, especially incorrect when the mass might be changing. So what we actually take to be the definition of force is not this, not mass times acceleration. It's the rate of change of momentum that actually defines the net force. So uh, the rotational version of that is to say net torque is equal to the uh, rotational the version of rate of change that part of it is you know still rate of change with respect to time and the rotational version of momentum angular momentum so we already calculated an expression for um, angular momentum here so we can calculate what the um, uh, what the uh, the rate of change of uh, angular momentum is. So this rate of change of angular momentum is, um, let me just write this out, 2 fifth mr squared. And let me just leave this as omega. <laughs> so this quantity here, in our case, because it's already told us that radius doesn't change, the rotation inertia will be constant. So this derivative can just go through it. It applies to omega. So you have 2 fifth mr squared times rate of change of omega. Um, yeah, which is you know angular acceleration. That's what I mean. You could have used this. <laughs> but this is on a conceptually sounder footing. And it, what if the question told you that the radius is changing at some rate? Then the expression that you would want to fall back on is this expression that uh, um, starts up from the definition of torque and is always valid. So let me plug in the numbers. I think I can actually reuse some of what I put in before. So uh, I put this in before. Or let me actually uh, copy the whole thing. And uh, I just need to change some things here. So, um, so let me... Uh, call this um, uh, d omega and I actually need to define d omega so that um, yeah. I, I know I'm not really using the correct name for it, that's fine that's going to be my uh, d omega over dt okay, rotation inertia is fine, substituting in all these things and instead of time we can just use the rate of change of angular speed that they gave us 2.8 times 10 to the minus 14. So that is a pretty slow change, I think, um, which I guess makes sense. Uh, radians per second squared, that is the basic SI unit of rate of angular acceleration. So oh, I could have named this alpha. <laughs> so, all right, uh, I think that's it. Let me just enter, yeah. So 2.80. <laughs> they probably started out with this number and then generated other numbers from that. Times 10 to the power of 24. This is the in the basic unit of um, the basic SI unit of torque. Um, it's worth checking because if they have metric prefixes here, then you should correct for that when you do the powers of 10. Uh, at some large enough of numbers, metric prefixes don't really make sense because it doesn't give you a lot of intuition anyway. So, so yeah, that's this question, uh, both parts, um, both uh, at some level, somewhat um, uh, simple application of uh, finding a formula that applies and plugging numbers in. Um, but these are the questions that I haven't done, so I wanted to do that.